I spent many years learning about chimpanzees more like us than any other living creature. But I've always known all my life that all animals matter. Every animal is an individual, just as every human being is an individual, and all are deserving of our respect and our compassion and our care. After I'd been with the chimpanzees for about one and a half years and was beginning to learn how amazing they are, I was told I had to go to Cambridge University to get a PhD. Now, I know it had no prior degree. And when I got to Cambridge, to my horror, I was told I'd done my whole study wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should have had numbers. I couldn't talk about them having personality, mind or feeling because those were unique to us. And... The reason that I, you know, maintained my belief that I was right was because when I was a child, I had a wonderful teacher, and that was my dog, Rusty. And he taught me that, you know, of course animals have personalities, minds and feelings. And I remember one of my first really vivid memories was going to stay on a farm in the country. And this animal-loving little girl who lived in London, in the middle of the city, you know, there were a few pigeons and things, face to face with cows and pigs and horses. I've always had a special love for cows. I don't know why, and of course I adore horses. And pigs are unbelievably special. The first animal I ever habituated was a pig. He was uh, in a field, and we were having a little tiny holiday. And every day I used to take my lunch time apple core, the core from my apple, and held it out. And one day he actually came and took it from my hand. And I remember an old lady calling out over the, over the gate and saying, little girl, little girl, don't touch the pig. They're dirty. They're full of diseases. And I always, you know, was a very respectful of old people. I actually enjoyed them, but I was really rude to her. I said, the pig's cleaner than you are, and I'm going to touch him, and he will not give me a disease. <laughs> uh, the main thing is that, you know, these farm animals, when you know them as individuals, they're just wonderful. I mean, there's nothing like hearing the wicker of a horse when you come and he's pleased to see you and the cows chewing the cud and the, the sweet breath that they have out in the fields and pigs, well pigs are as intelligent as dogs and more intelligent than most and uh, when I was a little girl I used to want to have a little troop of pigs and train them and go to a circus, well now I know circuses are bad but when I was a little girl, you know, pigs are amazing, just incredible. I remember when I first learned about intensive factory farming. I'd been in Gombe for a while and I came back and I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, and I was utterly horrified because, you know, when I was a child there was no such thing. And uh, I, the next time I looked at a piece of meat on my plate, I thought this symbolizes fear, pain and death want to eat that so from that moment it was just boom I stopped it's about the end of the 60s something like that and it's so shocking so shocking one thing's for sure that since I stopped eating meat I felt so much better I felt lighter and other people have said Yes, that's exactly right. And I think the reason is that uh, when you eat meat, particularly if you've eaten factory farmed meat that's been fed hormones and stuff, you know, you have to get rid of the toxins that that animal was, was fed. And so your digestion is working overtime and it's bound to have an effect on your health. In order to keep these animals alive in these horrible, horrible conditions, you have to routinely give them antibiotics, not just when they're sick, but just to keep them alive. 
and those antibiotics are getting out into the environment and the bacteria are building up resistance and actually people have died as a result of just scratching a finger because a strong enough antibiotic couldn't be found. And, you know, that, that is one of the harmful things that's happening to this planet through our overconsumption of meat and factory farmed animals. Whole forests have been and are being cut down to make way for uh, grazing for livestock or to grow grain to feed livestock. It's um, a very wasteful way of eating because it takes much more uh, vegetable protein to make into meat protein than if people can actually eat the vegetable protein. Uh, it's a waste of water, it takes a lot of water to raise cattle or whatever. And in addition to that, something which people actually often don't realize, most people now understand that burning fossil fuel creates um, CO2, which is part of the greenhouse gases that are leading to climate change, warming up the surface of the globe. But fewer people understand that when you have animals confined in massively for intensive farming, um, to keep them alive, you're feeding them unnatural things to make them grow quicker. And this is creating huge amounts of methane gas, which is a far more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. It's like eight times worse. And so our meat-eating behavior is having horrifying effects on the environment. Awful lot of people feel helpless when they think of some of the problems uh, of our planet today. And one of those problems, I believe, is the intensive farming of animals. Uh, it's, it's cruel, uh, it's very harmful to the environment, but it's also very harmful for our own health. And although you may think, well, what I eat doesn't make any difference, if it was just me on this planet, uh, who wasn't eating meat and everybody else was, obviously it wouldn't make any difference at all. But more and more and more people are becoming vegetarian. I mean, I meet them everywhere. And what makes me happy particularly is that many of them say after reading my book, Harvest for Hope, they stopped eating meat and that, that gives me a good feeling. Many, many people understand the problems in the world today. I mean, you have to be a bit stupid not to see that we, with our terrific intellect, nevertheless are destroying the planet, which is our only home. And I think the reason that so many people don't change their behavior is because they feel, what's the use? I'm just one person, so what I do actually can't make any difference. And nor would it make any difference if it was just one but more and more and more people are coming to understand what the problems are and what they ought to be doing, like, you know, eating less meat or no meat, uh, thinking about what you buy, where did it come from, how many miles has it traveled and caused so many emissions, did it involve child slave labor, was it harming the environment? Uh, all of these kinds of questions. And it, what people have to understand is it's not just you. All around the world, more and more people are beginning to make the right decisions. So I always say to people, if you could just spend a little bit of time each day thinking about the consequences of what you do, what you buy, what you eat, what you wear, how you get from A to B, how you interact with people and animals and, and plants, then you know, this multiplied by a hundred, a thousand, a million, you really start to see change. And this is why I love working with young people with our Jane Goodall Institute Roots and Shoots program, because young people get it. And again and again, in all these different countries, we're in 130 countries, and the young people know that what I do is going to make a difference. Because it's not just me, it's my friend and this friend, and I'm going to make my parents do it. And so one person, you know, it goes out with a ripple effect, and it's going around the world that each one of us makes a difference because it's a cumulative effect.